Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we explore the future and what this means for your leadership. We ask the big questions. What's happening on the horizon? What does this mean for us? And most importantly, what skills do I need now for leadership of the future? It's time to explore. Let's go. Hello there, it's Zoe and welcome to a solo sode. Woohoo! Ah, yes, lots to report on. My travels have finished. At least they have finished by the time you're listening to this. I am recording this episode on November 6th before I head to my last trip of the year to Canada, where I will be celebrating my dad's 80th birthday and my brother's 50th, and apparently my aunt's 60th. So 50, 60, and 80, those are some good innings. And interesting fun fact about my dad, he just signed a five-year contract for work. Yes, he still has a client. He's a consultant, an um, aeronautical engineer by uh, trade, and he's been consulting to this business for the last 10 or so years. And they still want him, and he still wants to do work for the next five years. Go dad. <laughs> so his, his brain is fully functional and operating, and I can't wait to see everybody over there. In the meantime, as I'm recording this, I just got back from WA, Western Australia, where I worked on a 11-day outdoor experiential program for middle management of a Singapore agency, a government agency, and it was full on. It was uh, a lot of long days, short nights, and intensive programs, and a lot and lot of fun. The Singaporeans are just fabulous people, and this particular client was wonderful. So I had a wonderful time there and some deep learning, which I'm going to share with you today. It's kind of a bear your soul kind of episode with a title like Blame Excuses and Denial. (laughs) You know, it's here for fun times, she said with an ironic, sarcastic kind of grin. Um, Yes, so more details coming up. Also on Planet Zoe, the draft of Olympus Bound, my sequel to the Olympus Project, is back on my desk waiting for the edits to happen. So one of my beta readers has given me some feedback as well, very strong feedback. And I've got to incorporate all this and redraft it. So that's been grinding away the back of my brain as to how I'm going to shape, reshape the story a little bit. So it's not as much of a rewrite as the Olympus Project was. I had to do some major reconstruction on that one. This one's tweaking. So don't know if that's going to be easier or harder, but that's on my agenda, hopefully to get it back to the next round of edits by the beginning of December to my editor. So that's all on Planet Zoe. On Planet Human, we have war, still war. We have war in with Israel and Gaza, in particular Hamas. That's ongoing and bloody as I write this. And we have the ongoing out of the news war in Ukraine and Russia. So not good things happening on Planet Human at the moment. And it's not good. It's depressing. And when I think about this, I think, oh, as somebody who has global concerns, how do we actually feel like we can be proactive and assertive in doing what's right? Part of that is knowing that the micro affects the macro. How are we showing up? How are we showing up in our day-to-day lives as leaders? Are we modeling the behavior? Are we modeling the ethics? Are we modeling the values we want to see in others, in the leaders that we are easily critiquing from afar? So with that comes to the main takeaway or the main stories. I have two stories for you around the OR and BED model. If you haven't come across it, it's OR is an acronym for Ownership, Accountability, and Responsibility above the line behaviors, because you can imagine an OR is above a horizontal line on a sheet of paper, and BED, which is an acronym for blame, excuses, and denial below the line behavior. And we often talk about this in experiential programs, is that behavior above the line or below the line, with a basically snipey judgmental (laughs) tone to it, because blame, excuses, and denial are not constructive leadership or team behaviors. And so we want to avoid those. But how hard is it to be, to have ownership, to be accountable, and to show responsibility? It's actually pretty hard. So let me share two stories. One of them is more, perhaps more benign than the other one. The first one is the case of the mystery poo. (laughs) Perhaps you've had a mystery poo experience in your life, in your world. Uh, Sometimes on various wilderness expeditions, 
somebody gets caught out and they do a mystery poo, meaning they do somewhere, they poo somewhere in the bush and they don't bury it properly. Why they don't bury it properly? Any number of reasons, but sometimes on occasion in a campsite, you might come across a mystery poo. And I have seen this play out in this way. You gather all the group together and go, right, there's a mystery poo over there. Who did it? <laughs> now, if you were in that situation and it was your poo, would you own up to that? Possibly unlikely. I think I would not be owning up to the mystery poo if it was me. Why? The shame and humiliation, right? Who leaves a poo unburied out in the bush? And like I said, there might be a number of reasons why you might do that. You might have been caught out and you, somebody was coming up quickly on you and you just wanted to pull your pants up and get out. In any case, mystery poo can equal shame and humiliation if you were to own up for it. And in that group situation, sometimes what happens is uh, a facilitator, this is not me, by the way, I think I would have just gone and buried it myself, but the facilitator may insist that someone own up to it or at least someone deal with it, take responsibility. Inevitably, a participant will say, okay, I'll go and deal with it and they'll take a shovel and go and bury the poo. Why am I telling you so much poo stories? My dad will be laughing. He says there's a lot of poo stories in my novels. And I'm like, hadn't really been across that, but I'm conscious of it now. And there's definitely a poo story in people stuff as well. So I must have had like something happen to me in my life. Uh, anyway, I would stop talking about poo and talk about the real lesson, which is about ownership, accountability, and responsibility. And it's hard because of the shame humiliation factor. So let's talk about this in the context of another more recent example where I am taking ownership, accountability, and responsibility for what happened, not involving poo. This is the case of the missing first aid kit. So we're about two thirds of the way through the outdoor experiential program. We're in a phase uh, called command post exercise where the teams have been scrambled and they are being sent out on these various missions to retrieve information and it's go 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 uh, lots of pressure and lots of things to get organized at in a quick time frame um, my role as a facilitator in these mini teams was to ensure sh safety and make sure everything was that they that that they take everything they need to, to have a successful expedition be it a kayaking trip a hiking trip or a caving trip say for example and in this particular situation we go through before they go everywhere they do a risk management plan they run that past me as the facilitator and i check off that they've got everything i think that they need including a first aid kit so that's what i did they did their um, the risk management plan they said they had a drug the a first aid kit and i said do you have the drug kit which is the second part of the first aid kit and they said yes I said great let's go so off we went um before we got in the vehicles, I said, all right, so just checking, you've got this, this, and this for the safety equipment, which included a satellite phone, first aid kit, drug kit. Yes, 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 verbal checks, off we go. So we get to the activity site itself. I wanna do a visual inspection to make sure that we have all these things because I know how things go. People go, yes, 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 we have it. We take off and they don't have it. So I'm checking through. Uh, we're about to launch on a kayaking trip. Do you have the portable stove? Yes, great. Have you got the matches? To put? Yes, we have the matches. Have you got the first aid kit? Yes, show me. Have you got the drug kit? And they showed me the first aid kit again. I'm like, no, the drug kit, the smaller red packaged stuff. And they're looking around, looking around. I'm like, where's the drug kit? I'm like, well, this is what we have. I'm like, well, that's not the drug kit. And I'm getting irritated by now because we're two hours behind schedule. <laughs> that's another story. But we're behind schedule and... I'm checking through all the details and they don't have the drug kit. And they're like, where is it? Well, we didn't bring that. I thought this was the first aid kit. And I'm like, I asked you way back at the beginning. We did it when we did the risk management plan. We did it before we got in the vehicle. You nodded and you said, yes, we have the drug kit. You don't have it. That is not acceptable. And I used my irritated school man voice on them. Oh, so bad. Now, I'm processing this a little while later. Uh, it was, turns out that there was a mishmash of systems in operation between the teams. And I was not following the official protocol. I had my own protocol of how to manage the drug kit and the first aid kit. Long story short, I should have been carrying the drug kit. Um, hmm, right, right. It wasn't over to the participants to manage that. And because we'd scrambled the teams, the other teams were operating on a different protocol, not one that I had established with my participants. 
So when I said, do you have the drug kit? They nodded because they had no idea what I was talking about. They were only referring to the first aid kit, which was as per their responsibility. So yeah, that moment of uh, that sinking feeling of mm, shame, humiliation, and just regret and embarrassment flowed over me big time. Why? Well, because my reputation was at threat here. I'd screwed up big time. I'd let my boss down. I'd let the other staff down. I'd let the participants down. And the consequences could have been very serious. Uh, I could have gone on that. We actually didn't end up doing kayaking. Again, another long story. (laughs) Part of the decision was not having the drug kit. A large part of it was being two hours late. Essentially, I could have gone on that operation not having my drug kit, which my drug kit included things like uh, painkillers, Panadol, Nurofen, asthma, puffer inhaler uh, for people having uh, airway difficulties, EpiPen. So serious drugs to help with more serious um, medical considerations. Nobody in my group had asthma or anaphylaxis. So not necessarily a huge risk, but you never know. People could get bitten by unknown things they didn't know they had an allergy to. Anyway, the potential consequences were pretty bad. So, oh, yeah, the shame and regret washed over me. Now, I could have easily just carried on. I chose not to. I knew that I'd really stuffed up. So I owned up to the boss and I said, yeah, yep, I went rogue on this one. Um, pretty disappointed in myself that that happened. Um, so I agreed. I would go and apologize to the staff, the uh, Singapore staff that was in my group, let him know what was going on. Then I apologized to the overarching client, um, the head mentor of the of the client group. And then I would go and apologize to the participants uh, because I used my schoolman voice and it really was not their mistake at all. Ugh. So yeah, <laughs> I'm saying that because it's still embarrassing and I'm really disappointed that I had that much of a negative impact on the group experience. All because I decided I thought I had a better protocol instead of just following the protocol. Mm. Yeah, mm. You no excuses for that. <laughs> so I'm staying out of bed and trying to stay in ownership, accountability, and responsibility. So I went up there and I ripped off that Band-Aid and confessed and um, I asked the chief mentor, Do you, is it okay if I go and apologize to the group? And he seems surprised by this. I think in their, in their system, the trainers don't ever admit mistake. So I've heard. I'm not sure if that's true or not. In any case, he was like, that's lovely if you do that. So I took a packet of cookies, waited for an opportune time, because at that point, the group was then immersed in another major activity where they were in charge of the entire cohort of 28 people. And so they were quite busy in their little operating area. Waited till there was a moment and I apologized to all of them, explained what had happened and owned all of it. One of them tried to interrupt me and say, oh, to be fair, I should have checked. I'm like, no, please just let me apologize. So good on, good on him, like for saying, you know, I had something to contribute to this. And at the same time, like he should never have had anything to contribute to it because it was my mistake from the beginning. So oh, it was so mortifying to do that. And they were so gracious. They, they said, thank you. They took the cookies and we carried on. And I felt like I had a lot of relationship building to do after that because, oh, wow. Um, in any case, that was my, <laughs> that was my case of the missing first aid kit story. And I tell you what, I knew exactly where that first aid kit was for every last moment of the program. And I will never make that mistake again. So ownership, accountability, and responsibility. It is super hard to put your hand up and say, I stuffed up here. Especially if you're in your position of authority, especially if you're in your visible position of responsibility. And you should have known better. I've had, I calculated 36 years of experience in this industry really? (laughs) Sometimes experience is a drawback because you can get complacent and lackadaisical about certain things. Was that part of what happened to me? I don't know. But I don't want to dig too much into why it happened, only that I don't want it to ever happen again. Um, Yeah. So where have you had the opportunity to take ownership, accountability, and responsibility? 
What was it like for you? How did you dig up the courage to face down the shame and humiliation that comes along with that and being able to be humbled in your own mistakes? Um, it's quite confronting. And I still feel I still feel it and I'm still metabolizing that. And yet, when we do this, when we do above the line behavior, when we own our mistakes, when we take accountability and responsibility for the things that go badly, as well as the things that go well, what we're modeling is better values. We're modeling honoring and respecting our fellow human beings. And as the micro affects the micro, we can hope to have a positive ripple effect out into the world when we do that kind of behavior. When we say, I care that we have a trusting relationship. I care that we look after each other. I care that I've stuffed up here and I've let you down and I don't want to do that again. When we give those messages to our teams, when we really truly live by them, we set the scene for something better for our human relationships down the track. So that when it comes to making choices on a global scale, We press pause before we go and launch bombs at one another. We press pause before we demonize others. We press pause before we judge others for their pain. We press pause and extend an olive branch before we drop any more bombs. That is my wish for humanity, and I think it all comes back to how are we showing up in the moment? Are we overcoming our mistakes? Are we overcoming our baser nature? Are we overcoming the challenges that come when we mesh status and power together so that we can lead with open-hearted compassion as opposed to judgmental oppression. So big one for you from dog poo to missing first aid kits to war. I would love to hear your opinion on this. I would love to hear your insights. I would love to hear your stories of ownership and uh, accountability and responsibility if that was you or if you've witnessed somebody else stepping into that and how it affected you, that would be awesome. Email me at zoe at zoerouth.com or write a comment on Zitter or X <laughs> under the uh, broadcast of this particular episode. Love to hear from you. So we are heading into summer next week here in Australia and heading into winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And as this comes out, I will be back from the cold and going into the heat, which is awesome. In the meantime, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast. To find out more about leadership of the future or to contact Zoe, go to zoerouth.com.